Hello everyone, and welcome back to the channel. In today's episode, we're delving into the scariest things people have seen that they definitely were not supposed to witness. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the video. I saw my father sitting in his truck at night in the winter with a hose attached to his tailpipe shoved into the truck window. He was in a dark place, and his dog knew it, and only I saw him. His dog wouldn't leave him alone, and he was unable to pull it off. I got a glimpse after his dog had already been aggravating him to come inside and had quieted down. No, the dog didn't alert me, and I never heard him. I only found out the dog had been urging him inside after he told my mom those things. I had no clue what he was doing until I rethought what I saw the next morning. In the 1990s, I worked for a summer in the IT department of a major pharmaceutical company. We were updating every computer on the campus, and I was responsible for updating the ones that had been air-gapped or were on small air-gapped networks. It was the summer that Windows 95 came out, but we were just updating everyone to Windows 3.11 and usually had to drop an updated NIC into their machine. One morning I had to update the machines in the R&D building on the backside of the campus. The lab I had to go to was far underground, at least three to four levels, so I went through about four layers of security, got a pass card, and was sent with no escort to the elevator. The slow, highly stable elevator barely felt like it was moving, and when the doors opened, I was staring at an impossibly long cinder block hallway, the walls of which were two to three stories high, and everything immediately felt heavy and oppressive, like shit was going on down here. The lighting was like something directly out of Twin Peaks with flickering lights and dark stretches. There was also a strange, high-pitched tension sound. Really strange. As I walked down the hallway, spaced about every 30 feet, there was a sealed vault door with a keypad and early biometrics to gain access. There was also a little window, maybe 3 inches round and at least that thick, and inside each room I could see things. Beyond each door was a dimly lit room full of cages, and in these cages were rows and rows and stacks and stacks of animals. The early rooms were mostly cats and dogs. Some looked fairly normal and healthy. Others were, altered. They were missing limbs, had skin sores, or what looked like tumors. There was a lot of distortion from the little window, but I'm pretty sure some of them were kind of mounted on boards with their skulls or abdomens opened up for observation. They were all alive. As I continued down the hall, I started to see monkeys and apes through the glass, all in the same condition. Suddenly, with the sound of pressure equalizing, one of these doors opened, and a technician walked out. That's when I realized the sound I had heard earlier was the screaming, the endless screaming, of hundreds of animals being used as test subjects in closed clinical trials. The technician was armed, and he didn't draw on me. I startled him, and his palm went to the pistol. This guy looked like Brent Spiner in the Area 51 scene of Independence Day. Totally crazy eyes, white lab coat, long greasy hair, probably mid-fifties, and standing in front of a vault full of monkeys and apes screaming to be killed so they could be free, with his hand on a gun. A gun he apparently needed for something he was down there with. I showed him my ID, and he sealed the room and escorted me through several more sealed doors, like something out of a biohazard outbreak movie, and back to his lab. There were about three other people squirreled away in there, all armed, and they physically stopped me from approaching their machines because of their research. They accused me of having snuck into the facility, of being there to make copies, or of being there to introduce false data into their study. All kinds of crazy shit. I left the NIC card and a floppy disk with the update on their workbench and left. This guy escorted me all the way back to the elevator, all the while standing about 4 feet behind me, like at any minute I was going to spin an attack. I definitely saw a whole lot of shit down there that I wasn't supposed to see. A NYC sanitation truck with an NYPD security detail on a quiet Brooklyn street at 3am we started watching because two cop cars came up the street the wrong way, with no lights on. Then a garbage truck arrived, with yellow spinning lights on. There were six cops in those two cars, two of whom went into a building across the street and came back out with garbage bags, which they tossed in the garbage truck. Repeat a few more times while the sanitation workers snake cigarettes a few buildings up. Cops get back into cars, laugh, and drive away. Sanitation guys get back in their trucks and leave. Whatever the hell six NYPD cops are conspiring to load into a city garbage truck at 3 a.m., I'm sure I'm not meant to know. This is much lighter than some other responses, but it was definitely interesting. I work for a company that keeps new projects under tight wraps. I have limited access to some information, as do my co-workers, but 99% of the details are locked down until the company goes public with them. 
I got a call from someone I'd never heard of in another building saying that a vendor delivered something for our department to theirs by accident. They told me to come on by any time to pick it up, so I went over. It literally felt like a speakeasy. The person I'd talked to wasn't there, so someone else cracked open the door to ask me what I needed, and I explained. After a couple of minutes of back and forth, they sighed and said, come on in, let's go get it. The building was the design and planning center for a huge new project. The walls were covered in concept art. I saw plans for things that had been announced, along with stuff that had only been rumored among the public. I got my package and was quickly rushed out of the building. I can't say what any of it is since it's still under wraps, and I like my job, but that was a damn good day and a cool story. About a dozen years ago, some friends and I shared an apartment on the third floor of a house in a sketchy part of town. One night I was playing video games, and I heard a hoarse voice outside the window saying, help me. I went to the kitchen, grabbed the largest knife I could find and a flashlight, then ran downstairs. I shined the light down the alley between our house and the next house over. In the weeds underneath my window, there was a large man hunched over a small woman. She looked at me with tears in her eyes. I screamed for my roommate to call the cops, and I held the knife out at the guy, telling him not to move. He stood up and walked away. She ran across the street into a nearby apartment complex. The police arrived a few minutes later and took my statement. One had me get in his vehicle, and we drove around in the direction I watched the man walk, but we didn't see him. In the end, he got away. My dad has a screen protector that is made so you can't see his screen behind or beside him. You would have to be breathing on his neck to see his screen. My dad is married to my mother. My dad has a buddy named Jim. He's always dating chicks. He had brought one of his girlfriends over one night. She was very drunk, and me being the gymnast I was, I climbed on top of the four-wheeler. My dad has a nice car. She climbed up and fell on my dad's priceless car. He begged me not to tell my mother. I did. She was pissed. It was your average winter day, waking up late, morning coffee, etc. My dad and I decided to go over to my aunt's house. As he was downing his alcohol, I sank up behind him. I could see he was texting someone. I decided to get closer. I held my breath, afraid that my father would notice me. The person that he was texting was called unknown. Confused, I read the texts. Dad, hey, baby, I miss you. Unknown, hey, when can I come over next? Dad, my wife's side of the family, and my kids are leaving on the 15th. They are going to South Dakota. You can come on the 15th. I froze. This was all true. He turned around and saw me. He gave me the longest lecture of my life. And a talk on how I should mind my own business. I told my mom later that dad was texting someone that was named unknown. My mom said, do you think he's cheating on me? Of course I do. She started bawling. Mom confronted him, and he denied it. She didn't believe me. Fast forward a few months, and my mom and sister went to South Dakota. The second day there, my mom got a call from my aunt's sister confirming that it was true. It turns out she knew a lot longer than I did. She had gotten many calls saying my dad and his slut were walking around Walmart and holding hands. It turns out that the slut was Jim's girlfriend. Jim is a very kind and nice person, so he told me the truth. He never dated her at all, and my dad must have made an excuse to him about having his slut come over. All the names in this story have been changed to prevent any hate. If this gets big, I will tell the rest of the story. I found out my uncle was a part of Yakuza. He was a very simple, very pale white man. Served an LDS mission somewhere in Asia and learned Japanese. He always said he worked in shipping and freight, which explained why he would go to other countries for weeks at a time. I found out when my uncle invited me to dinner and brought some of his friends along. Dinner goes well at a nice fancy sushi restaurant, and he goes back to say hello to the chef. He came back five minutes later, handcuffed, and was followed by two FBI agents. He was released three months later, as the prosecution didn't have enough proof to place him as part of the cartel. But based on the bags of yen and USD he kept in his apartment, it was pretty easy to piece them together. He's since passed. He admitted to getting involved with it on his mission and staying with it for 45 years. Good dude. Died of complications from a heart attack. I used to live in a town that had this pretty big outdoor amphitheater. I lived down the street from it, and really late at night, I used to walk my dogs down to it. One night I realized that they apparently leave it open to the public, and I walked in with my dogs. We were kind of just exploring the place at the entrance, and then we walked around a corner towards the stage. I looked out in the dark to the hundreds of seats to see a group of people placed directly in the middle, all wearing masks. There were about five of them, 
with lights shining only on their faces. Each one had a different animal mask on, with them sitting perfectly still and facing the stage. It seriously looked straight out of a horror movie, like they were doing a satanic ritual or something. I never booked it out of somewhere so fast. I knew that shit was none of my damn business. I still never figured out exactly what happened that night or what they were doing. But then again, I probably don't want to know. I was driving along the M4 into Wales one Saturday afternoon. I was minding my own business at about 75 miles per hour in the middle of three lanes of thin traffic. Suddenly, I see blue lights behind me, a little way back. There's a guy overtaking me, so I slow down a bit to let him in front and let the police pass. Out of the corner of my eye, I see the car with the blue lights pull alongside me at a crazy speed and somehow slow quickly enough and unnaturally enough to make me take notice, matching my speed, while the car in the fast lane takes his sweet time pulling in. I glance at the car with the blue lights. It's a base model Peugeot 106. Black plastic bumpers, clip-on wheel trims, wholly nondescript with very well hidden blue lights. For those in the USA, the non-sporting models of the 106 were offered with a 1.4 liter gasoline engine, maximum and might be able to do 100 miles per hour if you drop it off a cliff at 90 miles per hour. The road clears in front of him, and without any squatting, squireling, noise, or any sign of stress, he goes. I mean, he just speeds off at a pace I've never seen. I've seen an awful lot of race cars, but that was something else. It was like watching one of those awful sped up chase scenes from Knight Rider, he'd easily doubled his speed in a couple of seconds. I just put it down to being something I wasn't supposed to see. I once woke up one morning, mixed a glass of Ovaltine, sat at my computer desk, played Payday 2, looked out my window, and saw my neighbor masturbating on his porch in front of his 8-year-old grandson. Later on, I went to knock on his door to ask him if I could help him shovel the snow in his yard, he was old, but nobody answered. That's when I noticed a strange smell and a lot of heat coming from under the door. For some reason, I opened the door. A cloud of white gas immediately enveloped me, and I ran away. It spelled awful like antifreeze mixed with nail polish remover. I saw out my window, and he closed the door. At this point, I was throwing up and felt really shitty, feverish, shaking. I managed to get two and two together and call the police. He had been running a meth lab. I found my mother's journal. She found out she was raped repeatedly by her bothers growing up. I found it after my dad had cheated on her, so I also got to read about how she thought she should just kill herself so my dad would have the insurance money to take care of us. She wrote how she thought we would all be better without her. She found me reading it, and I asked her not to do it, and I made her promise before I went back to bed that she wouldn't. I had pretty bad insomnia as a kid. My dad's stuff was packed and sitting on the porch. They stayed together. And things seemed to have been fine since then. I still love my dad, and I understand why he did it. But that doesn't make it okay, it also wasn't the first time he did it to my mom. To this day, it haunts me. No matter how bad my husband and I get, I will never do that to him. He would never do that to me, either. We both had serious discussions before we married, and both agreed that if one of us cheated, it was over. It would make our relationship unrepairable and unforgivable. What it does to someone never goes away. When I was about eight, my dad was raising me by himself. He partied all the time and always had his biker buddies over at the trailer 24-7, and I would always hang out with them and smoke sometimes. Well, one night they were having a huge bonfire. I heard screaming and fighting, and then I saw my dad beating the living hell out of this man. I mean, he was close to death, well, my dad grabs him by the hair and tosses his ass in the fire, and the man jumps out of it kind of quick, and dad just kicks the fuck out of his jaw and sends him flying back in. Later on in life, when I was about 14, I learned that my dad, who was about to kill me, stole a couple pounds of weed and coke from my dad and his friends. Dad passed away a few months later and he told me he's sorry for all the fuck shit I saw as a kid and not to grow up and be like him. But I'll never get the smell of that dude getting burned. Having a smoke in my parking spot, I saw the car across from my spot pull in, it belongs to a couple, and while the dude got out fine, when the passenger side door opened, his girlfriend literally slumped out of the car and hit the pavement as she passed out. When the guy didn't seem that worried while trying to shake her awake, I asked if she needed help or if she was okay and the woman hopped up like she didn't just pass the fuck out of a car and stumbled toward the door. Long day at the brewery, ha ha, the guy told me. I'd seen them before, and they were always buying alcohol, but it wasn't until she came home alone one night with a huge case of beer and brown paper bags after that incident that it clicked that she might be an alcoholic. There's another woman with dementia who I always see going in and out of our building. 
I never realized how often she did it until I was on leave from work for a couple months, and she was literally in and out every 15 minutes. When I talked to her sometimes, she was always looking for her son, who she always told me was bald, and how they were supposed to be going to the casino. I assumed that the son didn't actually live with her and was just paying her bills, until one day I saw him and another neighbor chasing her down the street. It turns out I've seen her son a bunch of times, but he's always wearing a hat when I see him. He works as a professor at the local university, and I have no idea whether or not to tell him that his mother is in and out of the house all day, constantly looking for him, not realizing he is at work. When I was four, I was in my room when I heard a sound I hadn't heard before. It sounded like laughing, but off. I followed the sound to my parents' room, where my mom was sitting on the bed sobbing while my dad held her. When I asked why mommy was crying, my dad told me my grandmother had died. That was the first time I heard an adult cry. My mom and dad have their own bathroom separate from the kids one. When I was around 12, I felt like a grown-up and wanted to use the grown-up bathroom. We had guests over that night, so while they were all downstairs talking, I went to the toilet, and on top of the toilet was a line of cocaine, a cut-up straw, and a credit card. I cow 12-year-old me knew what it was, but I ran downstairs and told my dad there were drugs in the toilet. He obviously laughed and didn't believe me. But I dragged him upstairs and showed him. He asked me how I knew it was drugs, and I said, Ike, it just is. I promise it's not mine. Which he still laughs at me for. My dad quietly told my mom, and we narrowed it down to my mom's friend, who'd kept disappearing to the bathroom. Long story short, we stopped being friends with that woman. She had a young baby with her that day as well. I have no idea what came of her, but I got her kicked out of my mom's group of friends for doing coke. I suppose this qualifies, as I have not been able to find a possible explanation for what I saw. A couple of years ago, I was walking around town at night with my cousin, trying different street foods. We stopped at one corner, and that's when I looked up. I saw a significantly big red light with four smaller red lights surrounding it in the air. At first, the smaller red lights were slowly rotating one way, then they started rotating around the big red light in the opposite direction. All the lights stayed in their relative positions in the air. Once they started spinning in the other direction, the lights sped up, and all the lights just floated straight up, never coming back down. If anyone is wondering, yes, this really happened. No, I was not under the influence of anything. Way back in the day, back before Wi-Fi, back before cell phones, for ordinary people, getting online meant sitting at a desktop and waiting to connect, I wanted to connect to the internet but couldn't. Dad had been on the phone for hours. I had assumed he had forgotten to sign out and picked up the phone to be sure. Instead of hearing the grating internet sounds, I heard a woman talking. I distinctly heard my father say, and would you kiss me? So I hung up, calmly walked to his door, and yelled at him. He cornered me and kept yelling that I had made it all up. This went on for hours until I agreed. Not long after, he left our family and pretty much cut off contact with us. I saw on Facebook recently that he took his wife, not my mom, her 40 and 45 year old daughters, one of the daughter's husbands, and their two children on a cruise. He can't be bothered to even pick up his phone and talk to my children. He's a piece of shit. I can't say it anywhere else, but I feel nothing but scorn for him and his vile wife. My parents asked me to take the trash out. I was in the middle of watching a movie with a friend, so I told them I'd do it afterwards. They're okay with that. About an hour later, the movie is over, and I get up to go into the kitchen to take the trash out. We have a door leading directly into the kitchen, but that corner had stuff standing there in it and was really narrow, so everyone walked through the living room and around the corner into the kitchen, which took a couple seconds longer but was easier. I walk into the living room, and my mom is sitting topless on top of my dad. Both of them are shocked, and my mom quickly gets off and puts her shirt back on. I pretend not to see anything and walk into the kitchen. I squeeze through the kitchen door afterwards and couldn't look them in the eyes the next day. It was about 9.30 p.m., anyone could have walked in there at any time, and they knew I was going to take the trash out. I have no idea what they were thinking. After September 11th, I lived in apartments in New Jersey, and one of my neighbors was a suspect, so one morning around 4 a.m. I was on my way to a morning run, and when I opened the front door to my apartment to leave, there had to be 25 law enforcement officials. Secret Service, FBI, you name it. I walked directly into their apprehension of the guy and saw weapons I never knew existed. As a former Marine, I'm pretty decent at knowing weapons, plus I am an enthusiast. They had chrome rifles with some weird wires I had never seen before and still haven't. I would go as far as to say that they weren't really rifles, there wasn't a magazine or any type of cartridge. After they got their guy, who turned out to be one of the guys involved, 
every law enforcement agent put their weapons in a weird case, and a single file waited by a black van and deposited them. The funny thing is that I had a conversation with the dude's son on September 10th because he was supposed to fly back to Jordan, where his son lived, and the kid laughed and said, I would never fly tomorrow. In hindsight, the kid knew. I forgot to mention that they knew my name as soon as I opened the door, one radioed in that I was awake and leaving. They didn't bother me, but they were absolutely trying to hide those weapons. I am a criminal defense attorney. I am keeping some of the numbers fuzzy, even though this case is already done and I can talk about it. One of my clients was picked up for drug trafficking and was guilty as hell, but in order to help himself out, he successfully set up a drug bust on a much bigger dealer. The district attorney's office had been slow to act on the case, and we could not figure out why, either by asking directly or by sitting in jail. I had an idea, but no one would confirm what I thought was going on. I couldn't go in point blank and ask around other defense attorneys, including the one for the guy who my client busted, because my client was a confidential informant, C, on the case. If the other guy's case went to trial, my client would have to testify for the state. I learned what the hell was going on while I was interviewing a different client in jail. I was sitting on the public side talking to my client over the phone. It just so happened that, a few feet away from me, in the private attorney room was the defense attorney and the guy my client had busted. And they were both super pissed at each other. There is this thing called attorney-client privilege. The idea is that anything you say in private with your attorney is supposed to stay secret. But those attorney interview rooms are not soundproofed. And guess what? If you're going to be shouting at your client, your conversation suddenly isn't going to be privileged. Some things I learned. The defense attorney had no idea who my client was, and for whatever reason, his client was not giving up the name of my client to him. There might have been some trust issues there. They had wildly different opinions on the possible success of the case. Defense attorney's words, if you take this to trial and the C says what is in this report, you're fucked. The state had not disclosed to me the said report. They had until the end of that week to make a decision about the case. I finished up my interview with my client, while taking notes on both cases, as they were still in the middle of their argument. So in one broad stroke, all because of a frayed or broken attorney-client relationship that spilled out into me being able to hear a few feet away, I learned pretty much all of the information the district attorney's office had refused to tell me and why everyone had been dragging their feet. Soon after, I was able to use the information I received to resolve my own case. I used to do fire safety equipment inspections, installation and sales too. I've only told my family this and my closest friends and brothers. I was doing an inspection for fire extinguishers in a funeral home, and this usually involves me inspecting the entire facility, power plants were the best days, just tons of walking and getting to see some pretty cool stuff when I worked for this company. But when I had to go to this funeral home, which I won't mention for good reason, I seriously had nightmares after that day. Walking with the owner and full disclosure, working with the dead can tend to leave some people's communication skills with the living a bit off I'd say he was taking me room by room and explaining how he got into the business, etc. And then it happened. We walked into a room, and a poor elderly woman was. Almost like floating in water, due to rigor mortis. She was completely nude, having been recently worked on, and she was just floating on the table. Her arms and feet literally were at different heights lifted in the air, her head even was as if she were attempting to sit up. The owner apologized, but what could you really say to someone after something like that happens? Attending funerals was never really hard for me, I'm 26 now and was 23 then. The deceased were clothed, but of course it wasn't the same. But this was just horribly different for me. I'm not fond of going to funerals now. I tend to not peer into the casket anymore. I kid you not, the woman was in my dreams the following night. I can still see her and picture the entire day in my mind. She's been married to my stepfather for basically my whole life. She's really religious and hates gays, you know the gist of it. Anyway, a few years ago, I caught her sending hearts to this one person and being all lovey-dovey. When I asked her who it was, she simply replied that it was one of her female friends, although she was never as affectionate with her other acquaintances as she was with this person. I was suspicious, so I told my stepsister about it. We had no clue. My mother and stepfather didn't work and had to stick to a tight budget, so on winter days, me and my stepsister would sleep in the living room. When we would, they'd take a few sponges and put them on the floor, basically sleeping on them. I always found it weird personally, but I never questioned it myself. My little brother would sleep beside my mom, and one time I sneaked beside him while my mom wasn't looking. She had this iPod that she used for minor things, but never really for talking to anyone, except for that person I mentioned earlier. So, as a curious kid, 
I tried to make out the messages she was sending on the screen without my bad vision getting in the way. The only few words I seemed to make out were this person suggesting they make out and my mom being okay with it. I was disgusted and shocked. I never told her what I saw, and I honestly don't even think I'd like to. Also, she still talks to that person. I saw a video message on her phone when it was unlocked from them, and it was from a dude. A man. She was talking to a guy while being married and having four children to take care of. Wow. When I was 14, my parents divorced. My father moved us to a lower middle class area, and he began hitting the bottle. Soon he was no longer sleeping at home, and it was pretty much me alone every night. I started rebelling, smoking the Mary Jane, and hanging out with a little crew of hoodlums. One random Thursday night, my newfound hoodlum friends and I all snuck out at about 1am to go smoke weed in front of a gas station and see if we could talk someone into buying us some beer. As we were standing outside, where we shouldn't be, doing things we shouldn't be, we were laughing and enjoying the early morning. We felt grown up. Nothing could touch us that night. An older grey truck screeches around the corner and stops dead in the middle of the street. A man in his late 20s jumps out, he looks angry. He turns to face a newer white truck and throws his hands in the air. He looks like a working man, wearing jeans and a flannel type shirt. From the new truck, a younger white male in his early 20s pops his head out the window and screams, fuck you. He puts his head back into the window and starts revving the truck loudly, full RPM. A young white female on the passenger side screams a deathly scream, no. He floors it, running over the Hispanic male. What I remember most is the man's head hitting the hard street asphalt and bouncing back up. The truck seemed to have also caught his arm in the tire, causing it to bend all the way around. My heart instantly sank in my chest as I knew in that moment that I was not grown, but in retrospect, that was the night I grew up. I turned to my friends in shock, they had all already started running except for one. The oldest of the neighborhood mob. An 18-year-old who worked at Burger King on weekends. He ran to the body. I followed. My first instinct was that we must help this man, so I figured he was running to provide aid. I had to man up. I had to help. Only he wasn't running to his aid. He ran to him, laughed in this dying man's face, and took his wallet and told me to run. I stood in shock. Everything was happening so fast that I couldn't react. I couldn't move. I kept saying why, how, and yet I wasn't saying anything. I stood over the man for a few minutes, and I finally realized he was saying something in Spanish. He was saying, please God, don't let me die, please forgive me, God, please God, give me mercy, God, I don't deserve to die like this over and over and over. I kneeled down and told him, I'm sorry, I'm just a kid. I'm so sorry, sir. Please don't die, police are coming. And he was moving his head from side to side in wincing pain. He wasn't even acknowledging that I was there, it was as if he was talking to God directly. I was pleading with him, I wasn't even there for him. The sirens were coming from a distance now, they would be there at any moment. I ran to the gas station and told the clerk it was a white newish truck, they must have left this country bar around the corner. The man yelled, go home, kid, and so I ran home. I tucked myself into a ball and cried until morning. I didn't sleep for a second. The next day, I moved to my mother, never talking to those pieces of SHT again. 23 years later. I can still hear his voice. I can still see his pain. I cannot forgive myself for that night. So many things I could have done. A real man could have done. It was about a year after my mom passed away, so I was about 11 years old and my sister was 13. Her and I had a rocky relationship at the time, but we had our moments. When she was at a band competition on the weekend, I was dropped off with her. The time came when she had to perform, so she gave me her phone. I went through it, being the nosy 11-year-old sister I was. I was expecting to find some exciting 8th grade gossip or a secret boyfriend, but what I did find was not a laughing matter. I found dozens of self-harm pictures. Bloody sinks and bloody words were carved into my sister's skin. At the time, I didn't even know self-harm was a thing. I didn't confront my sister about the photos until years later, but I did immediately rethink all of our fights and how we were all hurting as a family. My sister and I are best friends now, and those photos did help me gain the perspective I needed to change our relationship, but they still haunt me. My wife and I vacationed in London a couple years ago. After dinner, we decided to go try out some local pubs because, you know, London. We didn't want to go to the tourist traps, so we followed around some locals. It was about 11 pm when we got to the last pub. It was a nice looking place with a younger crowd. I really had to pee, but I couldn't find a restroom anywhere. I walked up to the guy working the front door and asked him where the restroom was. He 
He looked at me kind of funny and said, upstairs. First door on your left. I thanked him and scurried back into the bar. The staircase was in the back left corner, blocked by a table. I found it odd. I had to ask the group sitting at the table to move to let me slide by. They thought it was strange too, judging by the looks on their faces. You could tell that these stairs weren't meant to be used, but I had been drinking and my bladder was about to burst. As I reached the next floor, there's a long hallway with about five doors. The bouncer had told me it was the first door on the left, so I tried it. Nope, it was a dark room with empty kegs. Pretty normal, maybe he meant the right door? Nope, a dark room with extra supplies. I started to wonder if I was too drunk to follow directions, but then I noticed that I could see light under the door at the end of the hallway. That must be the bathroom, or so I thought. I open up the door to find a group of people in very sharp business attire seated around an oval table. They were clearly having a meeting of some sort, with their laptops out. They were incredibly surprised to see me. They all froze in place, and we all looked at each other for a good 15 to 30 seconds. Finally, one of the guys says, what the hell are you doing, mate? I replied, I'm just looking for the bathroom, the door guy told me it was up here. They all looked a little confused, but the guy responded, we don't have a restroom in this building, now please leave. I apologized and closed the door, then headed back down the stairs, confused as hell. The good news was that my urge to pee went away. I slid past the group at the table and returned to my wife, who had ordered some fish and chips, and told her all about what happened. We both agreed it was strange, but ordered another round and thought nothing of it. About five minutes later, I noticed the guy in the very nice looking suit coming down the same stairs. He saw me, then went to the security guy at the front and said something to him, then pointed at me. I almost shit myself. The bouncer walks up to me and says, you guys have to leave. I told him that I had not paid my tab yet, and he said not to worry about it, just go ahead and leave. I obliged, my wife and I stand outside of the bar while we wait for our Uber to take us back to our hotel. The bouncer is sitting there, just staring at us. It was a very awkward 5 minute wait. When our Uber gets there, the bouncer says in a very Jamaican accent, you all have a very good night. Followed by a very loud laugh. To this day, one of the weirdest events of my life. Why were they having a business meeting at 11 PM in a pub on a Saturday night? Why did the bouncer tell me to go upstairs when he knew there was no bathroom? Why did they kick us out afterwards? Why did the bouncer creepily laugh at us? We have no idea what happened, but we love to tell this story and see what everyone's theories are. Way back in high school, I was in honors anatomy and physiology while also fighting a serious case of senioritis. Now I wanted a good grade on the final to keep my A and get a good GPA for the quarter, but I didn't study anything at all. Now to the story, the day of the final. I had it at 8.30 AM, finals week had two finals a day that lasted like two and a half hours each, and got to school at around 7.45 AM to do some last minute studying on the human skull. I was sitting outside the classroom when my teacher came by holding a stack of papers and her laptop, walked into the room, placed them down, and came back outside. She passes me and asks me to come help her bring more stuff in from her car while she runs to the office for something. Being the teacher's pet, I said yes and followed her to her car. My teacher proceeds to grab a single white piece of paper, place it on top of a stack of papers, and hand me the stack, telling me to take this into her room and to start letting people into her room as well. So I take the papers in, take the top paper off, and of course it's not the final we were taking. It's the fucking answer key. Now the test is 100 problems and 50 fill in the blanks on diagrams of various parts of the body, anatomical and physiological, the test was about to be hard. I take my phone out, take pictures of every page, and go to my seat in the far back, way away from her desk and very obscured from her view due to more papers and books she had stacked. Luckily, the pictures were of the version of the test I got, so I got 115% after the curve. She never expected a thing because throughout the year I was always a pretty good student and was considered one of the good kids by all my teachers, I was known by pretty much everyone in school due to my participation in school and family presence in the community. Now I just barely got through university, but GPA doesn't matter when you have a career. My dad's face as he was listing off all the friends that died during Vietnam. He never talks about it because of PTSD. He's talked to my mom a few times when they are alone. This time I was a teenager coming in to borrow the car keys. I just walked right in because the door was open. Then I realized my dad was reciting names. I looked over and saw the pure anguish on his face. Tears streaming. I realized I had overstepped, and my mom threw me the keys. My mom told me that later he started reciting names again and went for over 20 minutes, and this is on top of what he said before. My dad's an asshole. 
But I know he loves me. I still love him despite his giant personality flaws. I wouldn't wish the pain I saw on his face upon anyone in the world. If I feel comfortable enough, I share this with people when they ask me why I don't support the US's wars. I'm tired of our young men going out and getting killed, mutilated, or having mental health problems because they think they are defending their country and loved ones. Then they come back broken, pleading, and in need of the care that was promised them. And that is a real crapshoot. I'm tired of old, rich men sending out poor, idealistic young men to die for them so they can get richer. I'm tired of the constant warmongering that's going on. I'm tired of families being torn apart. In my country and others. I'm sick and tired of that anguished face forever burned into my memory. Last thing. I hate Richard Nixon. It sounds weird for someone who died when I was a kid. Mostly because he made the Vietnam peace talks crash and burn because he wanted the political clout that would come with stopping a war. Well. He sure killed those peace talks. And my dad was forced to fly to Vietnam the next year. I know my dad would have lived a much better life if he hadn't spent two years in that hell. And our family life growing up would have been a lot better without all the PTSD moments. Especially since no one knew what was causing my dad to freak out. Not even he himself. My third job, at 17, was at a pizza place. I had two managers, one male and one female, and they were both married to other people. Well, I went to hand in my drawer at the end of one shift and walked into the office, and there they were just making out with some heavy petting. Their spouses found out. They left their families, and then those two managers got married to each other. As far as I know, they're still together. I do conventions and corporate events for a living. I was once called into a room to fix a power cable. It was a meeting of a world-renowned house paint manufacturer. It was a closed-door meeting, and I had to be let in to do my job quickly. They didn't stop talking as I did my work. We've pulled all the units from production and recalled all units on the shelves, but the ones still in transit cannot be recalled. They might be caught when they reach the sales floor if the retailers are still watching the recall, but it will have been weeks since we issued it. The guy who then responds to that states that they can prove they did their diligence in court with the recall, and any units sold to consumers will be the retailer's fault. I never did get to hear what the recall was for, but they seemed pretty tense over it, legally speaking. So I doubt it was quality control. I felt like I had witnessed the mafia talking about a murder. The salaries of everyone working at the company I was working at, it was a smaller, startup digital ad agency with about 60 employees total were made by someone from HR who was making copies of a document that listed everyone's salary and left the original on the glass of the copier. I found it and turned it back in, but not before I went through that list to see what everyone else made and discovered that a couple new hires working the same position as me were making more than me. So after turning it in, I met with my manager and used my newfound knowledge to my advantage to successfully negotiate for a raise, along with a tacit promise that I wouldn't divulge what I knew to anyone else in the company. I moved back in with my parents after college for a year or so while I figured life out. They are the epitome of an upper middle class white couple in their 50s. Dad golfs a lot, and mom loves to stay at home and cook and craft, rather normal and albeit a teensy boring. One day, I went to borrow a pair of shoes from my mom. While looking for said shoes in her closet, I found about six large chests shoved in the very back of her closet. All but one were locked. Curiosity got the best of me, and I opened the unlocked chest. In it were about a dozen nipple tassels, three whips, a studded paddle, two ball gags, about ten wigs, a latex cop suit that zipped up to the top of the head, and about a million butt plugs. I can only guess what I would find in the others. So my parents are closet freaks. Half of me is scarred for life, and the other half is kind of proud of them for keeping the spark alive after 35 years of marriage, even if that spark is pretty kinky. I had a small business providing, among other things, state-funded computer literacy training to people with various disabilities. We're talking complete computer illiteracy, where you start with the difference between left-click and right-click and work your way up over months. I was working with a middle-aged TBI client who had been struggling hard with browser use and basic Windows functionality for weeks. He brought in his laptop and had obviously forgotten to turn it fully off, because when he opened it up in the middle of my workplace, the browser had been open to Pornhub Gay and a video of a nubile young twink getting plowed by a dude in a cowboy hat. He had used Windows Snap and Resize to create a search panel on the left side of the screen to feed videos into a separate series of tabs on the right via open in new tab and window to window tab dragging. This was logical, organized, and relatively complex porn browsing using multiple Chrome and Windows features. Dude was mortified. I closed the browser, said not to worry about it, trained him in incognito mode, and told him that, 
If this was any indication of his normal browsing methodology, he was making excellent progress. I was walking out of a bar one night with my wife, a girlfriend at the time, after celebrating my sister's birthday. When we got close to where the car was parked, we noticed a group of guys sitting on the front bumper of a car near ours. I pay no attention to it and get in the car, followed by my wife in the driver's seat. I look over at her, and she is white as a ghost, blankly staring ahead. The guys end up helping us back the car out so we won't bump into another car, and we head out. I ask her what was wrong, and she tells me that she saw one guy hand over a gun to another, who hastily put it under a rag or towel that he had in front of him. I remember seeing the guy with the rag, but I figured it was nothing. I called the police, who already had a street patrol going on, to let them know. Six cops descended on them and found two burner guns and three people with warrants. It turns out they were looking to ambush someone who was still in the bar because he had a verbal altercation with one of the group members. I had to hand it to my wife on how calm she stayed until after we left because I wouldn't have been as calm. A friend and I were walking down the street when we thought we heard firecrackers. It was in quick succession, though, so we wondered still if it was firecrackers or not. All of a sudden, a white SUV speeds down the road, it's 1 AM and another black SUV is close behind. We decided to get the fuck out of there. Our town is tiny, so we obviously heard about it the next day, and of course some fucking gang goofs were shooting each other up with automatic guns. If me and my friend had kept walking the way we were, we would have been in the middle of a fucking small town gunfight. Who the fuck needs to shoot people in a small town? It boils my blood that my friend or me could have been killed just because these goofs want to settle their problems in public. Also, our school was locked down because someone shot up a house and killed someone. A guy was arrested and admitted he shot up the wrong house, and it was another student's father, uncle, or whatever who was killed for no reason once again. Gang bangers are fucking stupid. In the 80s, I was a junkie, mostly meth back then. I was riding around with this guy I knew who was an old school meth cook. Not the kind we hear about today, but a bad kind of cook. Anyway, we were searching for chemicals. I had been up for days, maybe longer, and I was past the point of being able to drive. So I let him drive, and I slept, passed out. I come to as we are going through some kind of huge metal gate, and there were four or five guys with automatic weapons, I think they were, they looked like AK-47s, but the only ones I've ever seen were on TV, so, standing inside the gate. Mr. Dope Cook notices I'm awake and says really calmly, just go back to sleep, you didn't see anything. So I closed my eyes, and I was so wasted and tired that I did go back to sleep. He never told me where we were or what we were doing there, and I never asked. When I was in college, my friends and I frequented this restaurant near our university. We were there all the time, and we'd become really close to the owner, fondly calling him Chef Dad. We even used to play with his little daughter. One day, as I was washing my hands in the bathroom, I adjusted the mirror, and a tiny bag of heroin fell out. Freaked out and not knowing what to do, I quickly placed it back behind the mirror. I never told any of my friends about it. Years later, Chef Dad found me on Facebook, and we started catching up. He told me he'd fallen on hard times and lost the restaurant. He is also now living alone and has been estranged from his daughter for years. He said she refused to talk to him. He didn't tell me what caused all of it, so I just offered a sympathetic ear. But deep down, I know that what I found in that bathroom all those years ago has something to do with it. In my mid-twenties, my parents were trying to adopt a girl from China since they had all boys and always wanted a girl. They didn't speak or read English well, so I was in charge of going through their mail and translating any mail associated with the adoption agency. One day, a letter came with copies of their application, and as I glanced at it, I saw the date of birth, country of birth, etc. down the line, a date caught my eye, my marriage date, which was one year before I was born. I should mention that I have an older brother who is nine years older than me. One day I casually brought it up to my dad, as it was just us having lunch, and he stopped eating, looked over to me, and said, don't tell your mother I told you this, but your brother is your half-brother. His dad passed away when your mom was pregnant with him. Don't bring it up to mom because it still makes her sad. A former roommate friend stored like five shortish, narrow wood crates, and spray paint covered large plastic bins in his storage shed. The night they picked them up using a dolly that was defective, a load of them fell, crashing onto the walkway and rolling down into a shallow runoff drain, meth cooking gear fell from the unlatched bins, sawed-off shotguns fell, and ammo fell from the split crate. I acted like I didn't even notice that anything fell and that it was too dark to even see anything. They freaked out and kept yelling right in my face, don't think you're going through that side yard. Since it was the last dolly full, 
I was actually told to go lock the shed. My roommate tried to play it off, but he told me to go through the house and not by the side path after he got chewed out by the guy who stored it. The property was in a foreclosure paper jam, so everyone was expecting to vacate within a month and a half. I was so anxious to get out of there. This was actually just a few weeks ago. Let me preface this by saying my car has blacked out rear windows. I bought this car explicitly for the purpose of being able to see out the back without anyone being able to see in. My girlfriend and I drove down to a local state park that had a river that you could swim in. This was midday on Monday, so we were some of the only people there. It's lunch time, and due to the caterpillars attacking our table, we decide to sit in my car and eat. As we're talking, we notice a very attractive couple, both around 20, with a baby walking in our direction. We watched them, curious if they could see us through the window, the woman walked all the way up to my door before continuing on, before they passed and we forgot about them. Well, a short while later, as we're starting to clean up, my girlfriend says these exact words, I can see his dick. Me, a voyeur till the end, looks up and sees the decently hung young man butt naked by his car just three spaces down. My girlfriend and I watch as this man completely changes clothes in the open, just 100 feet from a restroom. As we laugh about the absurdity of what we saw once he finishes, I notice the woman grabbing a bag. I immediately tell my girlfriend to turn around as this woman begins to strip right in front of us. We laughed for several minutes as they got in their car to leave, but before they pulled out, we decided to reveal ourselves. I have never seen faces go so pale so quickly. And yes, the child was in the backseat the whole time. When I was 35 weeks pregnant, I did a side gig of holding a sign on a corner. One day, my mom used my car, so I had to walk back to our house. I walked about a mile to home and went inside to see all these letters scattered on the floor. I thought it was weird but didn't think anything of it. My little brother's friend was staying there for a bit because he had lost his house, he was like 30. I yelled for him because I knew he was probably home somewhere. He had just lost his dog too, so he was in mourning. I went to the top of the basement stairs, where he was staying, and he suddenly screamed, don't come down here, and I suddenly heard a loud gunshot. I ran downstairs, and he had shot himself in the chest with my brother's rifle. I freaked the fuck out but managed to call 911 and press against the wound while sobbing uncontrollably. He just stared at me with this blank expression and told me I wasn't supposed to be here. My whole family was at a family friend's wedding, and I didn't go because I had to work. I sat on the porch and couldn't function until I saw my family's cars pull up. I completely fucking lost it when I saw my mom. He missed his heart by like half a centimeter and lived. Married now with three kids. My dad had a police radio and would often go to police calls in case they needed a pastor. No one asked him to do this, but nevertheless he did. When I was around eight, a car collided with a cement truck just outside my small, rural town, and I happened to be in the car with my dad when he heard it over the radio. When we got there, we saw that the driver of the car had been decapitated, and their head was just lying in the middle of the road. My dad, a piece of SHT, left me alone in the car, 20 feet from a decapitated head, while he went to pray over the concrete truck driver. We sat there for about 15 minutes before the volunteer firefighters arrived, and someone had the sense to cover the head and body. I have vivid memories of the head 30 years later. In 2010, I was in an IT consulting firm outside of Washington DC due to the location, a lot of our clients ended up being government contractors. One of them in particular had some high-ranking prior military members, along with quite a few foreign contractors. The owner of this company was a huge prick, he would constantly make everything an emergency and be a smart ass every time someone came to fix his issues. This guy was in his 60s, married, had kids, tons of money, whatever. One of the days I was out fixing his Outlook issues while doing monthly maintenance on site, and he had left his personal Yahoo email open. This is where the rabbit hole started. It started with some odd subject line, and I noticed it was from his assistant. I can't really remember the subject title, unfortunately, but I opened it, and it was nude pictures sent to him by the assistant. After that, I had an oh shit moment and closed everything out. Curiosity got the better of me, though, and I opened the email window again with history and auto signed in. I soon started stumbling upon broken English emails. These emails would ask the owner when he was coming back to pay for them and take them back to America. He would respond back when he was coming back to them, etc. Just really odd reads. There was an absurd amount of these emails. I started putting two and two together. These contractors would have frequent visits to the Middle East but would stop off in Eastern Europe every single time they went. All the top C-level executives were going on an almost quarterly basis. They were all older, creepy-ass guys who ran the company. 
I always wondered if they were involved in or dealt with human trafficking or just cheating on their spouses every quarter and just being shit people. Let me tell you, though, that the office or company felt dark. I can't describe it. I didn't tell anyone, take screenshots, or talk to any of my peers. I had a discussion with my girlfriend at the time, but we weren't sure what to do. I ended up just having to do more IT work for the guy for another year before I bailed and landed another job. When I was 10 to 11, I woke up to my mom crying and begging for something. I was scared and confused, so I went to check what was going on. When I reached the living room, I saw my dad beating my mom. They didn't see me at first, but when I ran there and screamed at him to stop, he threatened to beat me too, and my mom told me to go back to bed. After he was done, he grabbed his keys and left, he always does that when he's angry, which kind of makes me think that he's cheating on my mother. I then ran to my mom and started crying, and she started crying. She called my aunt's husband and started crying her eyes out. The next day, I went to school and couldn't last for 10 minutes before I started crying, and my friend had to calm me down and take me to the bathroom. On that same day, my dad picked us up from school with his red trans AM, to make up for what he did, since they were on the verge of divorcing that day, but that didn't budge with me, and I didn't give a flying fuck about it. My sister was happy though because she didn't know what was going on, she was 12 to 13. I'm 16 now, and I learned that he beat her because, apparently, my mom was cheating on him, which caused me to question everything, and I'm honestly having a hard time coping with it, especially since my dad has Tinder on his phone and I even caught him talking to another woman. I told my mom about it, but she just ignored it. My dad tries to be friendly with me and stuff now, but I honestly can't give less of a fuck about him, and I don't know what the fuck to do at this point or who to trust. I have a hard time trusting people around me now, including my best friends and my sister. My boss was tax evading. I was working at a fishing resort and was fixing some plumbing under the main office, and I could overhear my boss talking to an old client about how if they paid in cash, they wouldn't have to pay any taxes, etc. I heard my boss having this talk or reminder with various clients who had been coming to the place for multiple years. I guess eventually my boss realized I obviously knew or just didn't care if I knew because she blatantly started having me burn documents of clients who had stayed there and paid in cash, etc. Mostly things like doc sheets showing all the things they purchased, like bait and gas, and other documents like notes and receipts that she used to keep track of how much they owed her. Then it evolved around my second year into her blatantly asking me for advice on stuff like, is there anything we can claim as income or purchases? Saying we bought cords of wood from local people when, in fact, she had me and my coworker go out and chop down trees for it. I guess this was so she could claim business expenses. She also claimed that we bought new canoes when the canoes in question had been laying on the side of a hill for the last 15 plus years. Things like that, she would ask me for advice and what she could claim as business expenses. Then, in my third year on the job, I'm using the riding lawn mower, and I pull out my phone to check the time because my shift ends soon. We had no signal or internet because we were out in the bush, and the boss was too cheap to get internet regardless, so she used dial-up, a customer came driving past, and I guess she saw me with my phone out and told the boss, and she came at me the next day about how I was playing phone games when I should have been working and wouldn't believe the fact I was just checking the time. So I got fired over that, which was pretty cool, so the first thing I did when I got home was pull up the CRA tax evasion form and fill that shit out. I still don't know how my boss, who had been doing that business for 40 plus years, figured I wouldn't rat her out the minute I got fired over some dumb shit. I'd give the report ever got attention or not because she died three years after I quit and her family sold off the business. But in the report, I told them I'd give them all the information I had over the last three years and would be 100% willing to testify in court, etc. It would have basically been an open or closed case for 100-200k plus unclaimed income a year, as well as wage theft and other various things. Was at a Thanksgiving lunch with co-workers. P.F. Changs. I worked in a doctor's office at the front desk. I was also dating my co-worker from the front. Most of the staff showed up for the lunch, including several doctors from the group. Time went on, we ate and drank. Then we drank some more. At this point, people started to trail out, heading to other functions or just going home. It's probably creeping on 4 to 5 p.m. at this point, or something around there. We've been there since about 12. At this point, it is me, my girlfriend, and another girl who was a surgical coordinator, a doctor, and a PA. The other girl, we'll call her M, was about our age, mid-twenties. She wasn't unattractive, though she did have serious acne. My girlfriend and I were actually friends with her at the time and had hung out with her and her boyfriend several years ago. The doctor is the youngest of their group, though he was in his early forties. He's generally a cool guy, 
though his personality sometimes reflects that he was likely a jock back in the day. He is also not unattractive and has been described by some female co-workers as hot. He also has a wife and two daughters under five years old, I believe one of them was maybe a year old at the time. As I said, time went on, people left, and soon, the PA left as well, leaving just us four. My girlfriend and I were pretty smashed, so we weren't really paying attention to others. We were really into each other, being kissy and shooting the shit well, I take a sip of my drink and do a casual look around to see Dr. and M right next to me, full of sucking faces. I discreetly turned back to my girlfriend and tried to calmly whisper, WTF? Look at Dr. and M. My friend was in disbelief. I'm not sure if we were obvious or if maybe they got a little too hot, but a couple minutes later, Dr. said, it's getting late, I'm going to head home. M followed with yeah, me too, I have to get to family, or something to that effect. We played it cool and said, yeah, yeah, of course. We're out in a second too, have a good night. As soon as they walked out the door, we ran to the windows and watched them both walk together to M's car. They sat in there for a while. Doctor emerged a few minutes later and walked towards his car. We gave it a few minutes and then left. We never told anyone, although we've had to face his wife a few times since then. Not someone getting killed, but it was pretty scandalous and shocking at the time. I was driving home from work on a busy Friday evening. I live in SoCal, so traffic is usually very slow. Today, however, it wasn't moving. After about an hour of waiting, we started to move at a reasonable pace. As I drove past what looked to be an accident, I saw the ambulance put a body into the back. The body was mangled straight to hell, to the point where it looked like a red trash bag and not a person. Along the road, there was a red schemer, and two feet in front of the ambulance was a destroyed motorcycle. The person riding it was smashed in between a semi and a regular car. There's no way that they survived. I don't think anyone should have seen that. Furthermore, I doubt the paramedics intended anyone to see the body, but the bag hadn't been fully sealed due to the misshapen form, it couldn't be shut right away. I feel very sad for the family, and it's a tragedy that should have been avoided. I grew up in a funeral home since I had no one else to watch me after school as a kid. I remember one time walking through to the back to go to the garage so I could look at the limousines and hearses. On the way to the garage, there was the room I was told to stay away from. It was the room they had the dead bodies in, where they would dress them and put on makeup. The door happened to be open as I walked by, and I saw a mangled body lying there on the table, unable to differentiate what body part went where. It was a gruesome sight. I mentioned this when I was older, as I never said anything about it at the time, and it turns out it was a guy who had been killed in a motorcycle accident. The saddest part was that the family requested an open casket funeral, and my dad and his co-worker had to try their hardest to sculpt him into a human resembling figure underneath the clothing so the family could see him one last time. This was just one of the many deceased people that I've seen in my day. I was at the funeral home every day after school, from kindergarten up to the fifth grade. My friend and I were at Disneyland on Veterans Day. We were on the Matterhorn, and we got to the part right before the tunnel, right before they launched you. All of a sudden, they announced that the ride was closed, and the line started clearing out. We asked to be let out of the car, and the guy said, we'll be with you in a second. Suddenly, walls started going up all around the ride. All the people who had been on the ride, who were in line in front of us, were leaving. I started to motion the guy again, but my friend stopped me and said, hang on, don't say anything. Let's see what's happening. After quite a while, we saw a gurney go out with a bloody sheet on it. The sheet was literally wet and stuck to a body. Eventually, we were in another line with some of the people, their cousins, who they left in the park. Who said that their cousin had lost his hat, and their aunt went on again to reach over the side and try to grab it. Apparently she fell out, and the next car hit her at a high rate of speed. I believe this because the lawsuit discussed in the paper a couple months later had these same details. I have found this on Snopes before, but they have the date it finally made the newspaper, January of the next year, ERK, after the lawsuit started. But I can assure you that it was Veterans Day, since for years that was the only day my friend and I went, since teachers could get half off and his mom was a teacher. This was about 1985 or 1986. I was manning an internal ECP on a fairly built-up multinational air base in southern Afghanistan. I was a driver, and my job was to rove the posts along the flight line during shift as a show of force and help my fellow Marines on posts conduct searches and such. This meant a lot of sitting around, bored out of our minds. Our only kill count was the number of flies we killed each day on post. This was pretty secure, not much ever really happened, maybe some IDF here and there, but nothing major, we had internet, showers, and air conditioning. 
Well, one night, bored out of my mind, I threw the inferred cameras on in front of our map out of sheer boredom. After a few moments, I saw a group of about five to six men scurrying across a line in an area close to the wire, where a lot of our local nationals, Afghanistan natives, would stay and work on base paving roads and such. The way they were in what looked like a formation and out at such an early morning time in the pitch black, probably 2 to 3 a.m., just seemed odd to me. The way they were moving was hunched over, like they were creeping. I hopped out of the vehicle and told my fellow Marines on the post, and they laughed. They never really took me seriously, mainly because I was a female, they carried on and thought nothing of it. Several months later, our replacements got attacked at that exact post. They attacked the hangar, and there was significant damage. I always think of what I saw on those cameras, and if it had anything to do with it and if those Marines had taken me seriously and investigated, maybe we would have found something. Semper Fi, 